Hello there, everyone, and welcome back to One Idea Away. You know, on this show, we face that, that crisis that's out there, this crisis of connection, uh, the disconnection that so many of us can feel within our lives because we want to get back to our center. We want to get back to living life from this place that really is much more aligned with our true nature, with our essential self. One of the ways that I talk about this, I describe it even as turning life inside out, meaning that there's just so many influences that are outside of ourselves, uh, whether that be our upbringing or our teachers or society that has all of these different expectations of us. And it's almost as if we are living with those external, uh, external perceptions and expectations, as opposed to really getting to know ourselves and who we are on the inside. And so I often refer to this as turning life inside out so that we can begin to come at life once again from what's really truly deepest within each of us. And you know, we've got one of those conversations that, that flips things around quite a bit today because of the external, the outside influence uh, that society and, and our upbringings can have on us. And this is one of those conversations that I will tell you, uh, it kind of strikes close to home for me, both from my own personal journey, uh, as well as now being a father. You see, there are th these phrases that are out there uh, that have really become very common uh, in society of be a man and toughen up and man up. And these are phrases that follow boys from the time that they're very, very young, all the way through the teenage and adolescent years, right on into adulthood. I wish I could tell you that I was not as familiar with those phrases as I am. I wish I could tell you that I haven't uttered those phrases both to myself as well as to others, but I have. And it's part of my own growth process. It's part of the own journey that I have gone through. I recognized in my own journey that there were moments where I did toughen up. I did what I believed a good man was supposed to do. And what are those things? It means that I had to suck it up. I had to keep it in. I had to show strength. I needed to never let other people see that I was sweating. It was that whatever was going on, whatever issue I was dealing with, it was mine and mine alone that I had to deal with. It shouldn't be anybody else's problem. And so I kept things in for a very, very long time, up until only just seven or eight years ago. I'm not even sure I recognized I had a body that was for use for other than just athletic or fitness or recreational purposes. I didn't realize the wealth of information and the signs that it was actually trying to produce to help me understand what was really going on in my own life. I just kept doing and kept moving forward as I thought a grown man was supposed to do in today's society. And I think that was just one of many, many influences and factors that led me to, to near burnout that had tons of frustration and stress building up within my life. And I found myself in a position with a career that really, truly I did love, but something wasn't fully connected. I found myself with uh, being married with two children, the youngest of which was a bright brown eyed little boy. And I kept thinking, you know what? There's got to be a better way than this. There's got to be a way for us to work with our boys, to work with our children in such a way that they don't end up just buying into this societal definition of what it means to be a man. And so for myself, I did go on a journey of opening up. It is not something that by any means happened overnight, uh, but I started to actually notice that I had these things called feelings. And it led me to an inner journey. It led me to a very different inner journey than I'd ever gone on before to get to know myself in a different way. It meant that I needed to peel back a lot of the layers of expectations and experiences that I'd accumulated and had conditioned me to be a certain way in my life. And I needed to peel a lot of that back. And as I begin to look at the state of the world today, I recognize not only the journey I've been through, not only the way in which I wish to raise my own boy, raise my children uh, with a certain level of awareness of getting to know themselves inside and not buying into certain societal definitions, the more I look at it and see that that's something that's present for so many other parents, as well as so many other grown men who are still struggling with this. I like to have these types of conversations because I do not believe that this is solely a conversation for men to deal with. I don't think this is only for parents or educators to deal with. I believe that this is an issue we all need to take a look at because we live in a more interconnected and interdependent world than we ever have before. So today, we're gonna get into the topic of masculinity. It's one that is getting much more coverage and conversation than ever before. And like I said, it's because it impacts so many of us. You know, I've seen enough to know and to feel that we could use a whole lot more understanding and compassion and kindness and patience in our world today and a whole lot less bravado and ego and territorial and travel type thinking. And so to do that, 
I actually want to have a conversation that gets at the very heart of masculinity. And so to do that, I am absolutely honored to have as my guest today, Dr. Michael Reichert. Dr. Reichert is the founder and the head of the Center for the Study of Boys and Girls Lives, which is a research collaborative with the University of Pennsylvania. He's an applied and research psychologist who's immersed himself in clinical research and consultative experiences that have afforded him a deep understanding of the conditions that allow a child to flourish in their natural environment and context, meaning in family and in school and in society. He's created and run programs in both inner city communities, as well as some of the most affluent suburban areas around the world. He has published numerous articles and several books, and it's his latest of which that put him on my radar screen, which is How to Raise a Boy, The Power of Connection to Build Good Men. And with that, Dr. Reichert, Michael, thank you so much for joining us here on One Idea Way. Hi, Luke. Nice to be with you and, and great to have this conversation. Loved your introduction again. And uh, uh, just want to, I think, uh, uh, say that, that so much, uh, it's so interesting to me how many of us dads find ourselves motivated by trying to be there for our children, our sons in particular, and to be there in, in ways that really nourish their full humanity. And mm -hmm. what that does for us, what, how it requires us to have a reckoning with ourselves, yeah. I think is this, you know, sounds like the start of a journey for you. It was certainly the start of my journey. Mm. You know, it's, it is something amazing about when, when we do see our children this way. We've talked about, you know, so many people say, oh, my teacher, you know, my, my, my children are my greatest teachers. And it really is. There's just this incredible mirror effect that they seem to have on us where we start to say, okay, we actually might need to take ownership of some of the things yep. we've gone through and been through in some of our own experiences, because we want them to have a, a slightly maybe easier time, be more aligned to who it is that they truly are. We don't want to see that conditioned out of them. <laughs> yeah, I think our, 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 our children, uh, I have a grandson um, who's, who's two and a half, and, and his birth coincided with my hatching this latest book project and, and sitting down to write it. So I was shuttling between, you know, digging into research and summarizing it and writing it, and recalling stories and going down and spending time with my grandson. And right in front of me was this flesh and blood validation of the ideas that I was trying to put together. Yeah. But in particular, what struck me about my grandson, what strikes me about him is he really is a relationship machine. Mm. He is wired to connect. You know, what's under the hood in, in that uh, human being are all of these uh, uh, evolutionary structures that are designed to evoke from me, one of his caretakers, your sons and your daughter and you, try to, to evoke from us a response to meet his needs. Mm. And, and, you know, it's, it's very hard to say to a little child, no, I'm not going to do what you need me to do. I'm sorry. I'm just hard hearted enough that I'm going to turn away from you. Yeah. We're just not particularly inclined to do that. Yeah. It, it, it's amazing. And I, I want to get to this idea of these relationship machines uh, that, that our children are and, and so much, honestly, of, of what human beings really truly are. I guess maybe part of what we could do is level set for everyone out there, meaning that there's some pretty eye-opening research that's been produced over the course of the last few years that describe, I know it's one of the phrases out there, you have a particular view of that phrase, toxic ma masculinity, uh, but it seems like the more that we buy into that image of masculinity, certain traits and qualities of what has been described as toxic masculinity, it's also now being associated with very serious ill effects uh, on us as well as on society, things of violence and depression and suicide, uh, among a host of other things that it's connected to. So I was hoping you could maybe give us a little bit of a level set of what you were seeing as you started to get out there and, and kind of understand the landscape of what we're facing. Sure. So, you know, I, I, uh, I grew up in a family with five boys and one girl. So, um, uh, and then I had got married and had two sons, no girls. And my, my, my older son has had one child, a boy. So there's a way in which I think from the get-go, I was uh, uh, immersed in boyhood and required to study it in order to survive. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, occurred to me when I was about 26 years old 
and one of my younger brothers died in a car accident related to substance use. At the time, I was working in family court as a, a counselor, helping the court system decide what to do with the more difficult cases that were coming before it. And, you know, 75, 80% of those cases were boys, adolescent boys. Um, and, you know, I just perceived some continuity between the life my brother lived prior to his, his unfortunate accident the lives of the boys who were streaming into the court and the lives of all of my brothers and, and friends all around me, you know, among whom there were numerous casualties and losses. Yeah. And what I perceived was that there was something about how we understood male nature mm -hmm. that was uh, uh, not working. It was erroneous. You know, if the proof of an idea is in its, in its success, its mm -hmm. execution, mm -hmm. what we were seeing were poor outcomes that no one was particularly taking responsibility for, yeah. but that were happening everywhere, um, normatively. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that really propelled me, you know, that something about being immersed in that world. Uh, and it, it coincided with the women's movement. And what I witnessed on the other side of things, on the female side of things, was this uplift happening. Yeah. Uh, women's lives being improved in dramatic ways, um, you know, statistically and in flesh and blood, uh, uh, you know, the lives of women all in my world. Mm. I began to see new attitudes towards their bodies and towards sexuality and towards having public careers and striking a work life, you know, work family balance that was different, making choices, having freedom. And uh, I, I saw that in the design of girls' lives, we were able to make dramatic improvements while concurrently we were leaving the design of boys' lives, boyhood, untouched. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I, so I think when I, when I had my first child, uh, and, and was shortly after that asked by a boys' school outside of Philadelphia, about a thousand boys, you know, ages uh, three years old nice. to 18, 19 years old. When I was asked to come on and help them to create a program, uh, uh, we initially called it the On Behalf of Boys Project. It was right at that time in the, in the early mid-90s when uh, the women's movement was really strong and everyone was wondering, what about the boys? Mm. I was in this zone, you know, where we were really commissioned by the school to, to develop a, a state-of-the-art understanding of boys' development and boys' education. And uh, I think right in that period of time, I realized that this wasn't a small problem, that th this was a systemic problem. Yeah. philosophical, epistemological problem. We were not grasping the fundamental nature of boys and needed to, needed to be more rigorous about, uh, uh, you know, doubling down on the science of mm -hmm. human development and male development and so forth. And as I did that, uh, uh, it led me to this inescapable conclusion, you know, that, that, uh, this new field, relatively new field of interpersonal neuroscience uh, had been really blossoming right during that, that same period, the 90s uh, into the new, new uh, century. And basically what that science boils down to is the fact that yes, we are hardwired in certain ways. Uh, in particular, we are wired to relate to other people. From the time we are conceived and born, we are looking to meet eyes and, you know, skin to skin and understanding to understanding. We exist and grow in relation to other people. Mm -hmm. That's simply how we're built. And anatomical structures of the brain uh, are, 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 you know, they, they privilege um, our relational uh, capacities. Yeah. And, and, you know, so here's this, this hardwired fact about human nature in general and we, we match that to our understanding of male development, and lo and behold, there's dramatic uh, uh, conflicts, yeah. contradictions. You know, we still largely believed 
that the the ideal man was the lone ranger and that the, you know from the time a boy is is able to walk essentially two years old research mm-hmm. shows us um, we find that prejudice beginning to weigh in on how we nurture our sons mm-hmm. um, there's this phenomenon called the mama's boy myth where mothers get the message from all kinds of sources that if they keep their sons too close They're going to undermine his masculinity, his achievement of independence. Mm -hmm. They'll create a mama's boy, a sissy. Mm -hmm. And many mothers, uh, you know, unconsciously absorb those ideas and they come to believe them. Well, guess what the result of that is for boys in general? It's, it's gotta be deleterious. Yeah. There's a, there's a fancy, uh, one of the psychologists that that is one of the pioneers of the field, a guy named Bill Pollack has this phrase the traumatic abrogation of boys holding environments you know it's essentially abandonment yeah that we push our boys out of the nest because we want to encourage the they're getting stronger and more independent without mm. recognizing that it actually is rupturing an attachment bond that is the source of a of a of a human's strength yeah so you know the idea that strength comes from connection is really the point of my book and that's mm-hmm. the thrust of that science you know, it's amazing to me, and I, I think that's because that was also one of the things that that had jumped out at me um, is this idea that very early on, because of this misunderstanding that we have about male nature, and you know, we we hold up these images of of the Lone Ranger and even you know Superman, right? The the individual Superman uh, that can handle everything on his on his own, so to speak, and because of that, we start to create abandonment and and attachment type of disorders as opposed to nurturing those in healthy ways. And so it, it sounds like what you're describing is that that trajectory begins very, very early for, you know, for a boy. Uh, and that, I mean, you, you make, a, you make a, a subtle adjustment at that early of an age by even a couple of percent, and it's going to lead to a very, very wide gap with every passing decade. Yeah, you know, the research is, is strong here. And this is relatively recent research. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it, it, it really is an emerging field, boyhood studies, where we are, you know, we really only began to um, dig into male psychology in a serious way and mm-hmm. extend that in particular into an examination of boyhood in the last couple of decades. But one researcher uh, uh, embedded herself for two years with a group of four year old boys. And she went to visit them at this local school, uh, observed them, interviewed them, interviewed their parents, uh, uh, talked to them in a group, talked to them individually. Mm -hmm. And over the course of two years, what she found was that through the course of their their years in that school, as they absorbed messages uh, about normative masculinity, how they were supposed to be as boys, everything changed in them from how they dressed, walked, talked, the toys they played with, the games that they played, right. how they related to each other, how they related to their mothers, to their teacher, and to girls. They even formed themselves into what they called the mean team. And they began mm-hmm. to chase after girls and harass them out of the blue. I mean, this, you know, they didn't right. conjure this out of some genetic uh, uh, predisposition to violence. Yeah. They, 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 they absorbed it from norms, from TV shows and images and messages they were getting. Another study uh, that I talk about in the book is what's called the man box study. And this is a, a study that took place recently, last couple of years. And it was a, a series of uh, 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 surveys and interviews with young men, 18 to 29 years old in three countries, the US, the UK and Mexico. And among the questions that they asked these young men, uh, one of the most sobering findings for me was they asked them, you know, do you receive these kinds of messages that you're supposed to submit yourself to these norms, these standards, and right. basically give up who you really are? And they said, yes, we do. Yeah. And one of the questions that followed that was, uh, where do these messages come from? And 69% of the American respondents said, from our parents. Mm. These messages come in our families, uh, consciously and unconsciously. And I tell stories in my book about how I found myself passing along 
some of those same messages yeah. and norms to my sons, really out of fear, the same fear that I talked about earlier, the fear that he won't be strong enough, tough enough, able to withstand, you know, life on the streets of, of, yeah. of you know, boyhood. You know, it's, it's amazing because it, it's several things that I, I want to I kind of pull out of, of what you've just described. Uh, but let me just start with kind of where you, you ended up. I think that to me is that what was very eye-opening as we talk about, I, I mentioned before, our, our children being teachers as well as mirrors to us, is that when I started to catch some of the things that I was passing along to my son and then seeing that actually impact and show up in different ways that he was looking at things or behaving, that to me was just this huge wake-up call of, wait, I didn't mean to, you know, I didn't mean to pass that on. I didn't right. realize I was doing some of these right. things, right? Because we're just, we're unaware of, of how conditioned we are in certain circumstances. And I think one of the things that, that was interesting that you brought up in, in strength of connection is that part of that misunderstanding of, of male nature and part of what I see as the emphasis of that, that misinterpretation, that misperception, is the emphasis on physical strength is part of it, right? It seems like we value this idea of standing up, of, of having this physical nature to us in some regard, and it's at the expense of very often the emotional nature. Very often you see those boys that I was, I was one of the kids, I was, I was good at school, right? And so that also meant that I had this mental strength that for a long time was, uh, you know, to, to the different than, than any physical ability that I had. And that was not seen as a strength. Right, that one, was, right, one strike right? against you. So you start to get yeah. separated based on the images yeah. of what a boy and a man is, is supposed to be. Yeah, you know, I, I notice in my, my two-year-old grandson, we were down at the playground down the street last week. And, you know, he's at that age where mastery and physical mastery in particular are really, really uh, uh, important to him. Yeah. Um, but one of the things that we were doing down the playground was uh, he was climbing up things and jumping off of them. And I loved watching, and he's a wonderful climber, he's a wonderful jumper, he lands on his feet, he's got great balance. But, but what he said to me was really striking. He jumped off one, uh, he went up, a, went up one step and jumped off of it, went up a second step, and I, I think decided not to jump off of that second step. And he said, when I'm older, when I get bigger, I'll be better. Yeah. And I, 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 I perceived him measuring himself against a standard and we all, all of us guys, we measure ourselves against this ideal that we have in our heads about how a man is supposed to be mm -hmm. and being strong, being agile, being dominant, mm -hmm. um, being independent, being unemotional, being stoic, being tough. Yeah. You know, these are, the, these, are, these are part of the ideal. Now, it doesn't matter that no man actually matches that ideal mm -hmm. or that that ideal is so unhealthy. Mm -hmm. The man box study I told you about yeah. um, found that the guys that most fully subscribe to the norms of the man box are the most depressed, the most anxious, and the most suicidal. Yeah. They're also the guys that experience more bullying and find themselves in the position of being bullies most often. Mm. They're the guys that are perpetrating sexual harassment. Yeah. Um, life in that box is terribly unhappy and it saps those men, I think, yeah. of their connections to other people, their empathy and their virtue often. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, I mean, with, with, with all of this and, and it's, we've got a, you describe it as something that we're not only learning from our families, it is also something that has become systemic uh, in, in society and in, in whether that's from uh, portrayal in media and entertainment uh, to just even national or international discourse and, and the things that seem to be, be showing up in, in those conversations. There is good news <laughs> as, as your research and, and your work is so much about of what it is that we can do. But I, I guess maybe as we move into that part of the conversation, Hmm. I'm in the back of my mind. It's like, okay, so now I'm starting to think about a few things. One, what can I do at home? Number two, what is it that I need to look at within myself as a father? Because so much of what I need to become aware of is things that I'm actually passing along and potentially creating myself. And then I guess maybe the third, which to me is the one that, that is the kind of like, oh, wow, what do we do? 
is the systemic side yeah. of this. Yeah, yeah. And so I was wondering if we can maybe walk through some of these levels of where we can begin that has a real absolute benefit at home and then start widening that out so that we can, we can really see what's, what's possible. How can we turn this Titanic? That's great. No, I'm happy to do that. And I, I do think that levels is the proper way to, uh, to frame it. And maybe I'll try to talk on two different levels. I'll, right. talk, I'll talk on the level of the, the individual relationship with a particular boy. Mm -hmm. And then I'll jump up and try to talk more systemically about Great. The, the nature of the times and some interesting, really exciting initiatives that are underway that I'm aware of. Excellent. Um, maybe to preface it all by saying, uh, Luke, that we're having this conversation today, you and I, and your reader, you know, your listeners are so interested in the conversation because I think this is the best time perhaps ever in human history yeah. to be raising a son, to be thinking about mm -hmm. caring for a boy. We're actually in a position, largely, I think, because of the, the reckoning that was forced upon us by the women's movement. Yeah. Um, I yeah. think that we're forced to ask ourselves, is how we're raising our sons working? And if it's not, what do we need to do to improve it? Mm -hmm. That's a fantastic time to be raising a boy because we can actually be honest, I think, for the first time about What's it, you know, who are boys and what do they really need and what's it going to take for us to provide for their needs in an, in an, in an adequate way? Well, it's, it's I, number one, I, I love the hopefulness that you're describing. And I, it just what comes to mind is the uh, commercial that had come out, the, the commercial that went viral Gillette, by yeah, Gillette. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, their, yeah. their phrasing of, of the best a man can get and asking the question of, is this the best a man can get? Because I, I do agree with you that in the face of the research and in the face of the reckoning uh, that I think is going on right now, it does present us with a possibility that perhaps may not have pierced the veil prior to this moment in time. That's right. I think we were all, you know, that, 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 that statistic from the man box study conducted by the Promundo organization hmm. uh, that 69% of parents are passing along these norms, these messages I think largely unawarely, some yeah. deliberately and consciously, mm -hmm. but I think largely unaware still of the impact of those norms, how it shuts a boy down, how it causes him to alienate himself from himself, yeah. um, and so forth. So on an individual level, what I would say is this. I do a lot of work in schools. Uh, some of my research, the prior two books to this last one, for example, summarized two global studies I did that zoomed in on the teacher-student relationship. And what we say essentially is that to get to first base in teaching a boy or coaching a boy, you first have to connect with him. He has to believe that you know him and he'll work for you if he believes you know him. He'll go to the ends of the world if he believes that you're someone that really has invested himself in an effort to care about him. Um, but absent a connection, boys are adrift and they're likely to, uh, 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 you know, um, vote with their feet, if not their attention and simply tune you out. Mm -hmm. um, so many schools are struggling with discipline problems and underachievement problems on the part of their boys. And yeah. you know, I think what our research found was that that's largely because we don't understand how deeply boys are relational learners how dependent they are on a relational connection in order to engage. Mm -hmm. So um, on the, that, that's on the teacher-student level. Mm -hmm. um, we can extrapolate that same finding to the parent-child uh, or parent-son mm -hmm. level. And what I can say is that in order to help a boy resist the cultural norms of masculinity, um, we're not going to be able to circle our wagons and keep those norms from penetrating. They're going to affect our sons the way that they did in that study uh, at that school of those four, five, and six-year-old boys. They're everywhere. And chances are they're going to be everywhere throughout your son's life. Yeah. Um, you're not going to be able to prevent him from being affected by those norms. He's going to have to negotiate with them when he goes to school or when he plays on a sports team or when he tries to, you know, have a, have a, fr a good friend or later on a relationship of, of some sort of intimate uh, uh, sort. And 
what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to strengthen his connection to himself. Mm. And, and in doing that, you're going to enable him to resist things that, ten, that, that threaten to draw him away from who he really is, how he sees himself. Mm-hmm. You're going to be what we call a relational anchor. Mm. And the way you do that is simply, it starts by listening to him. You mentioned earlier, uh, uh, you know, masculinity inside out. Yeah. And I, 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 I chuckled to myself because there's a parenting approach called parenting from the inside out. And it's essentially recognizing when we're present and when we're not. Yeah. And that when our minds have been hijacked by upset or worry or irritation and, and trying not to simply uh, 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 perpetuate that kind of parenting with our sons, yeah. boys evoke more of those kinds of reactions, I think, than girls. Mm-hmm. Boys tend to bug us or worry us. And we react from that, that low road part of our mind instead yep. of that high road part of our mind. Yeah. And so listening is the antidote to all of that. A boy who feels listened to is one who feels known. Mm-hmm. And when a boy feels known, he, he has a certain accountability that he feels. Ah, my dad knows me. He knows who I really am. He knows that I'm someone that cares about my schoolwork and that if I don't feel on a particular night like doing my homework, my dad knows that my longer range goal is that I do my homework. He might call me out on, on being lazy. Yeah. That kind of accountability. Or the little boy you know, who's feeling uh, scared for some reason and is taking it out on his younger sister by being mean to her. Um, yeah the parent that knows that boy can step into that situation and that boy trusts that the parent really does know and care about him. Mm -hmm. And so if the parent intervenes uh, in that moment, the boy feels in a certain sense seen and understood Mm -hmm. and, and, and essentially supported and helped to be himself. There's something in there that I just want to extract a little bit for everybody because I think this is so critically important where using boys as the example, because boys, you know, they do show up in different ways and, and the way that they, they, they maybe can um, provoke or evoke certain things within us, uh, you know, can be there just based on the way they interact. What you're describing to me is being very highly aware. And I think you even described this at one point in your book of being uh, relationship managers or relational managers and being aware of when we slip from being relational or being the parent or the adult in the room yep. and then dealing with our own stuff, right? Yep. Our, our yep. personal management. And I think that's a big piece of what you're describing is that when we feel like uh, we want to step in because something's getting too loud or the siblings are, you know, beating each other up or whatever it is that they're, they're rough housing, whatever. Right. And now all of a sudden, are we parenting and relating or are we just dealing with the fact that we're stressed out, we had a rough day, we just want them to quiet down and are really trying to clear whatever it is that happens to be going on for us. Yep. And I think that's a, a different level of awareness and mindfulness that we need to bring as parents so that we're not allowing our self-management to interrupt what we need to do in terms of being present for our children and our boys and what they're actually going through and listening and understanding the actual experience that's unfolding in front of you. Yeah, you know, I think we have to begin by acknowledging, by being honest with ourselves. You know, we, the, the uh, designers and the managers of boyhood, we have to be honest with ourselves that boys evoke mm-hmm. a, a tendency on the part of the people who are caring for them, a tendency to dominate boys. Mm-hmm. Instead of being with boys and building them up and trusting them and following their lead, we tend to react to boys by trying to suppress them and contain them and yeah. dominate them and correct them and discipline them, punish them. Uh, you know, all the research on, on who gets punished more, who gets punished physically more, yeah. who gets more disciplinary uh, demerits at school who gets suspended and expelled most often, things like that. Mm -hmm. You know, it all validates this fact that we respond to boys' behavior Mm -hmm. uh, from a place where we believe we have to exercise power over Mm -hmm. them, that boys need to be dominated. 
in fact, all that does is harden boys and drive them further underground away from us. Maybe, maybe they will submit to the discipline and in a certain sense, surrender yeah. to us. We yeah. don't want that either. What yeah. we want are healthy, strong boys who have a strong belief in themselves. Mm -hmm. And a boy who becomes dependent on, on external cues mm -hmm. is a boy who's lost his own voice. Mm -hmm. Contrary, you know, the opposite of that, the boy that simply can't fit himself into, into, into social structures, you know, that can't get along with his parents and who's mean to his sister and can't live by the rules and can't get along with teachers. Those are boys that are reacting, I think, to uh, uh, the opposite end of that same dynamic. Hmm. They're reacting to having been dominated, having been mistreated, and they're reacting with anger and disobedience, you know, a failure essentially to uh, cooperate, an unwillingness to cooperate. Yeah. So, you know, I think that this, this strategy of listening is really designed to convey to the boy that they're interesting in themselves and that we care enough about them that we want to know what's in their minds, what's going on. Mm -hmm. And we need to carve out time to do that, recognizing that something they say or do might try to pull us out of that zone, into mm -hmm. the zone of dominating and controlling. Mm -hmm. But we need, what we need to do is check ourselves and, and keep ourselves as long as we can in the mode of listening. And if we so, can offer that kind of blessing, that gift yeah. of listening to our sons, it'll make a huge difference in terms of strengthening their own inner sense of self. Mm -hmm. And it'll, it'll help them stand up against the bully in school or the peer group or the insecurity that they feel. You know, and it'll help them hold on to themselves. I say, in, in essence, if we want our sons to hold on to themselves, we have to hold on to them ourselves. I love that. You know, there's, there's again, so many things here. One is when we want our, our boys to kind of bend to our will from a place of, of you know, trying to dominate or, or control in, in any type of fashion, we're basically asking them to surrender their voice to our own. And that, in effect, is actually training them to follow the voice of, of society and of the influences outside of themselves, as opposed to listening and understanding and truly seeing them and knowing them for who they are so that they can find that voice within themselves, which is exactly what you're talking about, is that connection to self and building that for them is what we're really trying to model. So we need to be really, really cautious of not just the messages that we're conditioning, but even the patterns of behavior and, and, and energy and influence that we're conditioning as well. I think what you also, where you just you know, love where you were wrapping up with that of being able to, for boys to hold on to themselves, how is it that we can hold on to them for, for that? And I know that you've also described it as very often when a boy is, is acting out or, or has various behavior that might be going on that we're trying to contain in some, some, some way, is it really what we're trying to do with those moments is a test of can we hold them? Can we hold the space for them to be who they are? Can we be present with them at those times when they're you know, trying to sort through everything that, that they may be feeling emotionally? And it's almost as if we're there to try to let them know, listen, we can hold this space. We can be with you while you're trying to figure this out. We can see you and understand you through this process. And we don't need to try to exert significant control there. And I think that's a very, it's been a very interesting dynamic that I saw you describe in that is the way in which we really truly are being able to hold onto that space and let them know you're okay to play within here. I've got you. I'll let you know when there's some boundaries that we need to be really careful about, but they're almost testing up against that. And that's part of what we as, as parents, as educators uh, and beyond really need to be aware of is how are we holding on to, to that type of space and being present within those moments? Yeah, Luke, and, and, and you know, the, the, the reason we do this, and this is the good news in this story, mm -hmm. uh, the reason we do that is because if boys are able to hold on to themselves, if they are able to strengthen their inner boys, mm -hmm. what's there is goodness and virtue. Yeah. And we can actually trust boys to come out like my son jumping from that step, you know, they're going to land on their feet if they can be themselves. It's when they are filled with dread or compulsion or disconnection 
that they're likely to trip and fall. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the, the, the boy, there's so many stories of goodness and virtue in, in men's lives. Unfortunately, the stories that have been making the headlines in the last period of time have been, you know, the Me Too sexual assault stories yeah. or, you know, the long, long history of male violence and so forth. Yeah. And, and generally speaking, those guys that are perpetrating those, those hurts are hurting themselves. Hurt people hurt people. It's an aberration. It's not natural. Mm-hmm. So if we expand this out at that more systemic level, uh, if we could just turn to, to that side of things, yeah, yeah. I, I think we're getting that sense certainly of, of from a parenting and educator standpoint, what we can be doing in the, the one-to-one or one-to-few type of relationships but how do we start to grow this out so that we, we capitalize on the hope and the possibility that is there of this being a moment of, of both reckoning and awakening for us to do things different? Good. I'll just say, with, with respect to the parenting level, mm-hmm. uh, I describe three strategies in the book. One is deep listening, but the other two, I'll just name them, Please. are, are uh, special time. Yeah. And the other is a model for setting limits. You talked about, you know, building and holding the container. The model that I recommend is a listen, limit, listen model. Mm. And, and folks can find out more about those in the book. Excellent. Um, Excellent. I'll just talk about two, you know, I, I do think we're in a time when uh, it's actually legitimate uh, uh, and, and, and motivating to be investigating um, how we're doing things. And two organizations in particular, I'm on the boards of both, so I'm familiar with their initiatives, but I've, I've had recent conversations about both. One is a, an organization called Partnership for Male Youth, and mm-hmm. it's really about the unmet uh, 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 health needs of boys and men. Mm-hmm. We find that boys are on the wrong end, males are on the wrong end of premature mortality statistics, mm-hmm. for example the top 15 leading causes of premature mortality uh, are predominantly male. And the reasons for that aren't genetics. It's not something about our natures. It's not something about how we're wired, you know, to take uh, uh, unhealthy or unwise risks. Mm -hmm. It's because we are propelled both by, by, you know, the performative masculinity of, of brotherhoods and peer, you know, peer, peer norms, Mm -hmm. but also because we are, unconstrained by connections and we feel free uh, adrift even and and it's hard to value ourselves and take care of ourselves i think that the uh, concussion issue is a is a profound profoundly important case in point hmm. where for generations we knew that 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 you know uh, uh, football players or soccer players or lacrosse players, and my son played a bunch of those sports. Mm-hmm. Um, we knew that, that, that there, were, uh, there was the, the danger of concussion. Um, we, you know, most of the people in my generation, perhaps yours, uh, mm-hmm. you know, have stories of playing through, you know, playing yeah. despite, you know, concussions. Mm-hmm. Um, and yet what we're learning is that, you know, traumatic brain injury uh, is is a serious debilitating problem mm-hmm. uh, that often results from repetitive uh, 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 concussion, mm-hmm. and we're we're digging in. We're trying to you know fix helmets and change rules and you know no contact practices and stuff like that. But phenomenologically, it's just really yeah. important to note that these male sports have had this level of damage mm-hmm. and injury normatively for generations Mm -hmm. we're finally being we're finally able to say and this organization the partnership for male youth is is doing it and trying to do it in a in a very focused way Mm -hmm. you know what are what do we need to understand about men's health boys health and how do we need to design in uh physicians who are informed by that knowledge right uh, uh interventions that are aimed at males things like that so, you know, the whole story of boys' bodies is a story I try to talk about in some detail in the book because I do think that how we care for our bodies is actually the wellspring of our understanding of integrity. Mm-hmm. You know, you yeah. can't really understand integrity if you don't have, if you're not treating yourself uh, on the basis of what you know 
you need to be doing. Yeah. And it's as dumb as not putting on sunscreen when you go out in the sun, you mm -hmm. know, or, or taking an, you know, driving when you've been drinking or, you know, having unprotected sex when you know that's unwise, yeah. and, um, things like that. So that's the, that's the one organization. And the other is a boyhood campaign that's being launched by the same organization that did the man box study. Okay. And they're partnering with the Gina Davis Foundation to examine media images of, of boys and males in uh, video games and in, in uh, TV shows and, and movies. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the images? Because the, the slogan, the Gina Davis uh, slogan is, if I can see it, I can be it. Yeah. And the predominance of, of the characters who are portrayed in these video games or these movies or these TV shows are not necessarily modeling possibility for boys. Mm -hmm. They're modeling stereotypes and worse. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think that uh, that's an example of, of campaigns that are aiming to be national campaigns, big, you know, 30,000 foot interventions mm -hmm. that are trying to readdress uh, how we're designing boyhood generally, whether it's in the physical realm or the realm of media participation. Yeah, I think these are these are you know big issues that we need to be facing from the the media standpoint, the entertainment industry standpoint, uh, the big issues around sports uh, and the 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 physical side, the physical understanding and integrity that you're talking about uh, as well. And I think one of the the other things that I've seen. And it's kind of what I want to encourage everybody out there, uh, that, that everybody that's, that's listening in, tuning in to, to our conversation today. I even found, and, and, and this was honestly to, to uh, the direction of my wife, was that when she started to talk about how she's aware of programs that we have invested in and, and have been able to do for our daughter and was less aware of things that are out there for our boy and for boys in general. And she started to talk about, well, these are some of the things that, that you know, we're concerned with. These are some of the things that we're looking out for. What are you aware of? Uh, passing along articles and, and, and information from various different sources and magazines of here's how we can help our boys to emotionally develop, to develop that sense of self so that they, they are stronger internally and not as influenced by some of the, the cultural or societal expectations. The reason why I bring this up is that as soon as she started to share it and to talk about these things, some of the other parents started to respond and say, yeah, we're seeing this too. Yes, we're worried about this too. And so I raise it because there's more people and there's more parents that want to have this conversation, that want to be involved, that want to be engaged. And very often it's something that yet again, we're repeating the old pattern of keeping it within our household, keeping it within our family, keeping it within ourselves, as opposed to talking about it much more openly making it the point of conversation so that maybe it spills over to a PTA meeting. Maybe it spills over to a meeting that, that goes out to the education board. Maybe it spills over across different schools and across a district. And the more that we start talking about it, the more that we as parents start talking about this for our children, the more that we can show that influence to the education system, the more we can demonstrate that influence in the way that we show up and do or do not consume certain media and news, it's a, it's a really important groundswell aspect because I think the more, and I think Michael, part of what you're describing is that there's the systemic efforts that can be driven through certain ways. There's what it is that we can be doing at home. And the more that we can create a groundswell of activity, maybe we can get these forces to meet in the middle. And at that point, yeah. we're going to create much more substantial change. Yeah. You know, the thing I would, I would say in closing at, at my end, Luke, is that, um, you know, when my grandson came into my life, I was so conscious of the fact that he absolutely believed that I knew what I was doing, that I, that I had prepared a place for him in the world yeah. that was actually going to meet his needs and treat him right, and that he could trust me and continue to trust me. Yeah. Um, boys aren't in charge of boyhood. We are, and it's our jobs to get it right. Michael, I greatly appreciate that, and I greatly appreciate the, the work that you're doing, the conversation uh, that you're, you're contributing to, leading, starting in, in many different regards, uh, and it's, it's one that, that I really do hope just continues to cascade uh, into our international conversations, not even just our, our local ones, uh, because it's a, it's a really important issue for us to be addressing, and I think I, I have to say I agree with you. 
uh, I think now is a very interesting time for us to be facing that reckoning and facing and, and even supporting uh, that awakening around this. Thank you, Luke. I really enjoyed talking with you and, and uh, good luck with your son. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, for everybody, number one, again, it's, it's uh, Dr. Michael Reichert, uh, How to Raise a Boy, The Power of Connection to Build Good Men. Strongly encourage you to, to check out that book as well as check out Michael online because he contributes to psychology today and a lot of other, other places and resources where you can get some great information. I think for all of us, you know, there, there's just so much here from this conversation and from this work that we can dive into. And as always, this is the beginning of a conversation. This isn't meant to wrap everything up in a bow and say, okay, here you go. Just go, go do those things. This is meant to be an ongoing conversation. It's meant to get you to take a look at and to reflect on what is this going to mean to you? What is this going to mean to your parenting style? What is this going to mean to the way that you work with your children and with your boys? How is this going to affect conversation at the, the kitchen table or in the family room or after school or before school. I really want you to take a look at this uh, conversation, to like, take a look at some of the questionings and some of the tools of things like deep listening. And what is this going to mean to you? How is this going to impact how you're showing up on a day in and day out basis? And to be honest, how is this going to affect the way that you do your own work? Because part of this is not just about how to raise a boy and how to raise our children but it's how can we begin to look at ourselves and reconnect in a much deeper way and to find that alignment, to connect through mindfulness, because that creates the space within ourselves that creates a much bigger space for our children to be in as well. So I want to thank you as always for tuning in to One Idea Away. I thank you so much for being here, for participating in this conversation. And until the next time, continue to enjoy the journey check out Ipex Coach Training Program at ipexcoaching.com slash OIA. And of course, to find out about all the conversations, events, gatherings, all the things that we've got upcoming, then head on over to oneideaaway.com forward slash community. Thank you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed it. And if you have, please do us the favor of subscribing, reviewing the show, as well as sharing insights or comments that stood out for you in this episode.